It's TV school time. WOY TV, in association with Iowa State Teachers College, presents another program in the Iowa TV School Time series, Landmarks in Iowa History. Today's topic, South English. Your teacher is Herb Hake of Iowa State Teachers College. Boy, have I got a cold. Hello, boys and girls. Sorry you caught me with my nose in my hand. I'm paying for that trip I made to Grundy Center last week. Remember, we were on that farm, which was the boyhood home of Herbert Quick, and it was below zero? I'm sure you remember that. Well, the cold weather is gone, but my cold isn't. And so I hope I get through the program all right today. I have all the things that I need, I think. I have a full box of Kleenex and some nose drops and some throat lozenges and in case my throat gets dry I have some coffee here so don't be surprised if I have to stop to treat myself I've got enough things here for a drugstore you know by a strange coincidence this is a drugstore or was a drugstore this old house here in South English was a drugstore at one time, about a hundred years ago. It isn't a drugstore now, it's a, a private dwelling. But right here, where these streets cross, this is Main Street right here, at this point where the streets cross, here at the old drugstore, was the scene of the Tally War, sometimes called the Copperhead War, sometimes called the Skunk River War. Now, if you should hear any one of those labels, you'll know that it refers to this war that took place right here on this corner. And today, I'd like to talk to you a little about that Tally War, or Copperhead War, or Skunk River War. Now, that word Copperhead, I think, requires a little explanation. <coughs> Remember I told you last week that the term copperhead did not refer to the snake, the copperhead. It has a special meaning. And there are many people who are confused about that word because they sometimes think that the copperheads were the same as the Knights of the Golden Circle. Sometimes the Knights of the Golden Circle were identified by a little circle of course, they couldn't afford to make them of gold, and so they were made of copper or brass. But people carrying those were not copperheads. <coughs> Let me show you where those terms came from. I'll have to make a drawing for this. Before I put that chalkboard up, I'd better put the easel up. When a person has a cold like I have, you forget about some of these things. I should have had that easel up there before we started. <coughs> well... Now, the Knights of the Golden Circle were organized way back in 1854. That was before the time of the Civil War, you see. And these people organized a society, and their plan was to invade Mexico and take a lot of land away from Mexico to make a great slave plantation. Let me draw a map here that shows just where that was to be located draw a map of the United States first. There's the Pacific Coast. Here is the Rio Grande River. There's the Mississippi going up there. Here's Florida. And there's the Atlantic seaboard. Now, Mexico comes down like this, and then there is the peninsula of Yucatan, like that. And here's the Pacific side of Mexico. Now, the idea of these Knights of the Golden Circle was to invade Mexico and take away from Mexico a whole strip of land around on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. This is the Gulf of Mexico. Now, you see, this, this forms a kind of a, a circle here. If all of this were made into a slave plantation all the way around the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, it would be a kind of a rough circle. 
a golden circle where these people expected to make a lot of money. Well, they got nowhere with this. There weren't enough people in the organization to start an invasion, and the United States government was against it from the very beginning, <coughs> and so nothing came of this plan. Perhaps we ought to finish out this map of the United States a little bit. Here's the Grand Canyon in here. <coughs> Here's the Mississippi. Here's the Red River flowing in over here. Appalachian Mountains. And so we get a picture of Uncle Sam here frowning upon this whole idea of taking land away from Mexico and forming this golden circle. So you see, Uncle Sam didn't think much of that idea. But the Knights of the Golden Circle didn't disband. The Civil War came along, and these people in the Knights of the Golden Circle decided that it would be a good secret organization in favor of peace. That is, the Knights of the Golden Circle were against war. They believed in secession, all right. They thought that the southern states had a perfect right to withdraw from the Union, but they thought they should be allowed to do that without any kind of warfare. They should just be allowed to peacefully withdraw from the Union and form their own country. But the Knights of the Golden Circle continued to be a secret organization. Nobody knew exactly who the members were. Now, the Copperheads were something else again. And perhaps we ought to have another drawing for that <coughs> so that we can be perfectly sure we understand the difference between the Knights of the Golden Circle and the Copperheads. Because the Copperheads are the ones with whom we are concerned today. Now, the Copperheads worked in the open. And they were identified by an actual copper head. And where did they get this copper head? Well, they just took the head from a penny. And a penny, of course, was made out of copper. And the pennies of those days had the head of Miss Liberty on them. And of course, it is not considered to be polite or legal to cut up pennies, because pennies are part of our money. But they did it anyhow. That is, they cut the head from a Liberty head penny, and that was a kind of a badge, that was a kind of a button which meant that anyone wearing that was a copper head. The head from a copper penny, the head of Miss Liberty, meant that members of the group were copper heads. Now, the copper heads were the Peace Democrats. Republicans didn't belong to this organization because the Republicans all supported President Lincoln. Most of them did, at least. But the Democrats, in some numbers at least, were opposed to war. They didn't believe in going to war because the South had left the Union. And the people who belonged to the Copperheads used this head of liberty because they believed that the South should have freedom or liberty to withdraw from the Union if it wanted to keep its slaves and live its own life and not be bothered by the people in the North who didn't believe in slavery. And the Copperheads worked in the open. They didn't care if anybody knew that they were Copperheads or not. The Knights of the Golden Circle were secret. So remember that difference. Now, perhaps before we get into the story of the Tally War or the Copperhead War or the Skunk River War, we should understand a little bit about the Civil War itself. You see, the Copperheads would never have been organized if it hadn't been for the Civil War. The Civil War, as you know, began in 1861. And the South left the Union, and that was what started the events leading to the Civil War. I want to show you a few pictures in this book, which is the best book that I have found so far about the Civil War, 
in the matter of pictures. The pictures in this book are all made from, from negatives that were actually made during the Civil War itself. Pictures taken by Matthew Brady and other famous Civil War photographers. Not only photographers who took pictures of the Northern Army, but also photographers who took pictures of the Confederate Army. When Abraham Lincoln was elected president, and I want to show you a picture in this book of Abraham Lincoln, a picture taken during the Civil War when he became president. When Abraham Lincoln became president and before, that is when he was elected president, and before he had even taken office, South Carolina decided to leave the Union. Here is a picture of Lincoln at the time he was elected president. The people in South Carolina said, with this Republican president, it means that slavery is going to be abolished. Now, Lincoln never said that when he was running for president, that he was going to abolish slavery. He didn't like the idea of slavery. He said that a nation cannot endure half slave and half free and he hoped that there would be some peaceful means of settling the differences between the North and the South. But it wasn't until the war had been advanced by several years that Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which made all Negroes free. When he was elected president, his main concern was to save the Union, to keep all the states together. But before Lincoln had ever even become president, South Carolina decided to leave the Union, and it wasn't long before there were other states in the South who also decided to leave the Union. And before Lincoln was even inaugurated on March the 4th, 1861, Jefferson Davis, this man whom you see in the picture here, had been elected the president of the Confederate States of America. The war, that is the shooting war, didn't begin until April of 1861, when Fort Sumter was captured. Fort Sumter was in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. And when these states in the South left the Union, they said, now all of the things that are here, which belong to the government, or which belong to the former United States government, now belong to us. And they said that fort out there in Charleston Harbor now belongs to the South. And they demanded its surrender, and the commander there refused to surrender, and so the first shot was fired against Fort Sumter, and it was captured, and that began the war. That is, the shooting didn't actually begin until the capture of Fort Sumter. Now, the thing that we must remember about the Civil War is that it was different from any other war that we had ever had before. <coughs> the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 had been fought, and also the war against Mexico, all of those wars had been fought against people outside of our United States. And the same thing was true also about World Wars I and II and the Korean War. We fought those wars against people who were far away, and all of the people of the United States were against England in the Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812. All the people of the United States were against Mexico in the Mexican War. And in World Wars I and II, we were against Germany and, and Japan. But in the Civil War, we were fighting among ourselves. Now that gave rise to many, many awkward situations. Because in these United States, people who had been born in the South moved to the North, and they were caught there when the war began, even though they still had relatives and, and, and people of their own family living in the South. And many times, a uh, person who had moved from the South was fighting with the Army of the North against members of his own family in the South. And that caused many, many hard feelings. And there was always this belief that the war should never have started in the first place, and the South should have been allowed to start its own country. And then instead of the United States as we know it today, there should have been two countries. That is, two nations the Confederate States of America, and then the United States, which would just be the part that we think of as the North when we talk about the war between the states. 
Now, you can understand that there would be people living in the North who sympathized so strongly with the people in the South that they were willing to help them. And they would try to get people to go down there and fight with the South. And they would supply ammunition and guns and things of that sort to the people in the South. And the people in the North didn't like this. And so the people who sympathized with the South <coughs> were called Copperheads. And as the war advanced <coughs> and more and more people were killed, this sentiment got stronger and stronger. Abraham Lincoln had a great deal of trouble with his generals, you may remember. Here is a picture showing Abraham Lincoln as a clown, and he was considered to be a, a buffoon, an entertainer, because he liked to tell stories. And here you see he's taken all these dolls out of the cabinet, each one representing a different general. The first general he had was McDowell, and McDowell couldn't win any battles against the South, so he appointed McClellan. And McClellan, after trying in vain to get started and to do something against Lee, was finally replaced by Burnside, and Burnside was defeated. And President Lincoln appointed Hooker as general. And it wasn't until he appointed General Meade, <coughs> who was the winner in the Battle of Gettysburg, that the North began to turn the corner and to begin to win. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. <coughs> and on July the 1st, U.S. Grant, General Grant, captured Vicksburg on the Mississippi. So there were two important victories against the South in 1863. Well, when the tide against the South began to turn, <coughs> The people in the North who sympathized with the South became even more desperate and decided that they would have to help the South even more. And one of the men who believed in helping the South was the man who was killed in the Tally War and who gave that war here in South English his name. His name was Seifert Tally. His family had come from Tennessee in 1848 had come up to Iowa because of the good land in Iowa. But you see, the family had grown up in Tennessee, and by birth and education, they believed in slavery. They believed that the South should be allowed to have its own way about this, that it should be allowed to withdraw from the United States if it wanted to, and that there should be no war about it. The whole thing should be settled peacefully. So this man, Seifert Talley, preached this doctrine. And he was able to do this preaching because he was a minister. He was a Baptist preacher. Now, I think we should know a little about where South English is before we get into this story of Seifert Tally. <coughs> Here is our map of Iowa. This white spot is the point where we are today. This is South English. And here, just a little north of it, is North English. And they have this name because both South English and North English are located on the English River. This isn't a very big river, but it's big enough to have a name. This is the South Fork, and this is the North Fork of the English River, which flows into the Iowa River and then goes to the Mississippi. A little southwest of South English is Sigourney, which is the county seat of Keokuk County. Now, don't get that county mixed up with the city of Keokuk. The city of Keokuk is way down here in Lee County. This is Keokuk County, not Keokuk itself. But Sigourney is the capital or the county seat of Keokuk County. And here on the other side of the Skunk River, this is the Skunk River, here is Rock Creek, the Rock Creek Cemetery, about which I'll tell you in a minute. Remember last week when we were up here in Grundy Center that I told you that Herbert Quick's father had been accused of being a copperhead just because he had not voted for Abraham Lincoln, just because he happened to be a Democrat? Well, Herbert Quick's father proved that he was not a copperhead. You see, it is, it is sometimes a common thing for people to accuse others who do not agree with them of being communists or copperheads. In Civil War times, people who did not agree with the majority were called copperheads. 
Now we sometimes call people communists, even though they have no connection with the Soviet government, even though they never belong to the Communist Party. We call them communists just because they disagree with us, which is obviously unfair. Well, that's what happened to Mr. Quick. He was called a copperhead just because he was a Democrat. But this was too far north for copperheads to operate. Most of the copperheads in Iowa were here in the southern part of the state because Missouri down here was a, a border state. <coughs> and since the people living here were closer to Missouri than the people living up here, there was more copperhead activity, shipping arms, shipping ammunition to the south from these positions than from up here. <coughs> now let me show you some pictures. <coughs> Excuse me just a minute, boys and girls. My throat is getting dry and I must do something about it. <coughs> Boy, that's hot coffee. But it makes my throat feel better anyhow. I shouldn't have stood outside so long last week in that sub-zero weather, but I wanted to be sure that you got the program. I don't like to miss these weekly visits with you. Now let's look at some of the landmarks connected with this tally war. <coughs> Here in Rock Creek Cemetery, south of the Skunk River and south of Sigourney, is the church which was served by Seifert Talley, a Baptist minister, Baptist preacher. Now, nobody interfered with Mr. Talley as long as he didn't speak too loudly and too brazenly about his sympathies for the South. But he was known to be a sympathizer with the South. He was known to be a copperhead, and he made no effort to conceal it. Then, fairly early in the war, a Union soldier was sent back to Keokuk County to be buried, and somebody asked Seifert Talley to preach the funeral sermon. And so the group gathered in the church here. This is the inside of the church, you see. And just before Reverend Talley could begin the sermon, someone out in the congregation said, we're not going to have a copperhead preaching a funeral sermon for this brave soldier who died defending the Union. And so the service was conducted outside. Mr. Talley, recognizing the fact that the people in the congregation didn't think that he was capable or that he was patriotic enough to preach this funeral sermon in their church, went outside and preached the sermon outdoors. And then he realized that he could no longer expect to hold his congregation, and he gave up the ministry. But because he was a very, very able speaker and orator, people persuaded him to make speeches about his opposition to the war. And he was invited to many, many places where there were many of these peace Democrats. And even though the people in the community said, we don't want Talley to preach to us or to speak to us, he went anyhow. He was a brave man, but not very discreet. <coughs> Here is a scene along the, the Skunk River where Talley and his friends among the Copperheads live. Now you see, this is a pretty wild country, and there isn't much room here for people to seek them out. It would be very difficult to find these people if they wanted to hide. Well, on August the 1st, 1863, which was just a month after the victory at Vicksburg, just a month after the Battle of Gettysburg, in both of which battles the Union had won resounding victories, on August the 1st, 1863, the Peace Democrats decided to have a rally on the English River, which is just a little north of South English. And they knew that the people in South English were Republicans and were strong Northern sympathizers. And so, in order to protect themselves, they made the trip in wagons from their place near Rock Creek. And in the straw at the bottom of the wagons, they hid guns and pistols just to protect themselves in case they needed to. 
while they were having their meeting in a grove north of town, the Republicans were having a rally in South English, right here at this corner. And they were pretty excited too, because they knew the Copperheads were having this meeting just a few miles away. And then when the Copperheads came back through South English, some people on the outside of town said to Mr. Talley, you better not go through South English. There are a lot of people there that have guns, and I don't think they'll let you get through. And Mr. Talley said, I, I'm not going to fight. I just want to drive through town on my way back home. And so he started. And this mob here in South English <coughs> began to yell at him and say, you copperheads are afraid to use your guns. And that, of course, was too much. And some of the people in this party coming from the rally on the English River began to dig in the straw and get their guns. And someone in the crowd here in South English fired a pistol by mistake, and everybody thought the shooting was starting. And Mr. Talley himself began to be alarmed, and he pulled the pistol and stood up in the wagon. And as he stood up, someone in the mob shot him through the head. And of course, he died. Well, the followers of Talley decided to be revenged. And they gathered on the Skunk River in their home territory and decided to organize an army and march on South English and really do some shooting. Meanwhile, the people in South English sent word to Governor Kirkwood of Iowa, and the governor sent the militia to Sigourney. And as soon as the people on the Skunk River heard that the militia was in town, they decided they wouldn't fight after all. And so there was no war. The Skunk River War, or the Talley War, or the Copperhead War, was fought at this corner. In all, maybe a hundred shots were exchanged. Only one man was killed, and that was Seifert Talley. And he was buried in this cemetery at Rock Creek near the church, in this old cemetery here. And he lies buried <coughs> under this stone, which you'll find in the Rock Creek Cemetery. And at the bottom of the stone, it says, a martyr to his religious beliefs, murdered by highwaymen in South English on August the 1st, 1863. Well, you may say that wasn't much of a war. Why go to all that trouble in telling us a story in which only one man was killed? <coughs> it is true that there were no major battles of the Civil War fought in Iowa, even though Iowa supplied many, many men for the Union Army. But this was a fight between the two forces and it was, in many senses, and in many respects, a war. What happened in the case of Seifert Talley was that he misunderstood his functions as a minister. Here is the pulpit, the kind of pulpit that you find in the Rock Creek Church. Now, he was not content to merely preach the gospel of love, which is the responsibility of every minister, He became a rabble-rouser. And instead of preaching the gospel of love, he became a man who preached the gospel of hate. And so, he was killed. <coughs> Next week, we are going to Ames, where Iowa State College is celebrating its centennial. Until then, goodbye. Today, your teacher has been Herb Hake of Iowa State Teachers College. Landmarks in Iowa History is produced for Iowa TV School Time by WOY-TV in association with Iowa State Teachers College. TV School Time is presented daily, Monday through Friday at 1.30 p.m. by the Iowa Joint Committee for Educational Television.